Chancellor, your excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues. I'm John Ravenhill. I'm the head of the School of Politics and International Relations and Research School of Social Sciences at ANU, and I'm currently acting director of the Center for European Studies in the absence of Professor Jackie Lowe, our director who is currently doing research in Germany. So on behalf of Jackie, I warmly welcome you to the ANU and to the Center for European Studies. On our collective behalf, I acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. This year, we celebrate 50 years of formal relations between Australia and the European Union. Already, many events and activities have taken place to mark this special relationship, this special occasion, including a Europe Day lecture by Minister Bob Carr at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in May. For this center, the highlight of our programs this year is the Conversation Series, a monthly event where European ambassadors and prominent Australians come together to talk with a senior journalist. These events are recorded for ABC Radio National's Big Ideas program and are also telecast on Sky News. Details and links to podcasts and video links of past conversations are posted on our website. We are also developing a coffee book and video documentary from this series that will be launched next year. I'm sure at a very reasonable cost uh, it will be. <laughs> this evening we stage conversations number 10. And I'm very happy to welcome back Paul Bongiorno as our facilitator. Paul, I'm sure, needs little introduction to all of you. He is, of course, Networks 10's National Affairs Editor. He is also the co-host of the 10 Networks National Political Program, Meet the Press. Paul will introduce our distinguished speakers. So please, just a gentle reminder, do turn off your mobile phones. And also, please do stay after this event to enjoy the drinks kindly provided by the embassies of Greece and Austria. Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, I'll try to manage time for this conversation better than I did a couple of uh, conversations ago. So about uh, 6.15, I'll throw it open to the floor and we'll have uh, 15 minutes of your comments and or questions to our panel. So let me introduce the panel. Uh, on my immediate left is the His Excellency Dr. Helmut Burke, Ambassador for Austria. Then we have uh, His Excellency Harris uh, Defaronos, the Ambassador for Greece. Then we have His Excellency David Daly, the Ambassador for the European Union. And then we have Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, who of course is Chancellor of the ANU and a former long-serving Foreign Minister for Australia, amongst many other distinguished roles that he played and still plays. So to keep uh, to the format generally, so that uh, when the book comes out, people will understand what the attitude of uh, Greece and Austria is compared to all the other nations we've had represented. If I can start with you, Helmut, why, uh, why is Austria a member of the EU and, um, and how have you gone with it as a country? Thank you, Paul. I mean, the Austrian Tourist Board has been running this campaign uh, depicting Austria as at the heart of Europe. Uh, and it's partly and frankly how we see each other. Uh, we have basically always felt from you know, our point of history as well as geographic location of being situated in the heart of Europe. And at a time when the European integration process started, in particular when the uh, Treaty of Rome came into being, we've always looked at the European integration per se as something you know, we were much interested in. What happened historically though is that uh, from the time when the last <coughs> Allied soldier left Austria in 1955, Austria declared its status of permanent neutrality. Uh, which basically uh, meant that we would not belong to any of the military blocs at that time uh, and that we would not participate in any of the uh, military actions no matter where they occurred. This was also seen uh, at least by one signatory in particular of the state treaty, i.e. the then Soviet Union, <coughs> as definitely <coughs> not being in accordance with any desire to join the European integration process. 
1960, Austria became a member of the then EFTA, European Free Trade Association, which in 73 uh, actually started in a free trade uh, agreement with the then European Economic Community. Um, and from that time onwards, uh, relations, when it came in particular to exchange of goods, etc., were very close. Uh, in the 80s, we all know what happened in Europe, in particular at the end of the 80s, uh, was the fall of the, <clears throat> of the Berlin Wall uh, and the so-called end of the, the war or the two you know, military blocs confronting each other. So in the early 90s, um, we brought forward uh, our request to accede to the European Union, uh, negotiate for a relatively short time, and when the whole negotiations was done, we basically put the question of membership to the European community, the European Union, uh, to the Austrian people, which overwhelmingly was about 66%, so two-thirds of the population voted yes. From that moment on, we basically joined in the beginning of the 1st of January 1995, together uh, with Finland and Sweden. Uh, we have been a member of the European Union. Um, and it's not only well accepted and rooted uh, in the Austrian population, so to speak, and obviously in population as well as, as the Austrian government, uh, there have been clear benefits deriving from this association and membership. Do, do, you th do Austrians think of themselves primarily or in the first place as, as Europeans or as Austrians these days? Austrians <clears throat> see themselves as being centered in the heart of Europe, mm -hmm. therefore as Europeans and okay. Austrians. <laughs> <laughs> We, we are dealing with diplomats here. <laughs> <laughs> Greece is a relative uh, newcomer. Um, uh, can you give us a bit of the history of, the, of Greece joining the EU? We joined in 81. Uh, the first uh, opening towards uh, the then European uh, economic community was in the 60s. We considered ourselves as uh, a natural, let's say, partner of uh, the continent because, you know, without exaggeration, the Hellenic heritage is a basic component of uh, the values of the Union. So uh, we began in 61, there was an association agreement. Unfortunately, Greece was uh, uh, devastated by a military dictatorship, which lasted from 67 to 74. Uh, this delayed, we retarded the process. Uh, but uh, uh, after the restoration of democracy in 1974, uh, the process was uh, accelerated. In, so in 81, we became members. And uh, coming to your possible question, uh, Greek and European uh, are, I think, the two identities which are balanced, and uh, there is a natural osmosis to that. Did, um, did joining the, um, the EU have an immediate uh, economic effect for, for Greece? It, there, there was, a, a, certainly yes. at the time of the, uh, in the build-up to the Olympic Games, there was uh, a lot of economic activity uh, as yes. well. But was it more driven by uh, access, uh, freer access to, to Europe? Paul, uh, the main consideration in '74 was the restoration of democracy and the strengthening of it. Mm. Because we had a very potent military residue of uh, powerful uh, putschists. Uh, so this uh, we, was very gracefully absorbed by the political system itself and our participation uh, to the European uh, Commission at that time was extremely helpful because uh, it gave us the strength, the institutional strength to move forward and uh, don't forget that at the end of 74, there was a, an invasion of uh, Cyprus by Turkey. So the military regime and this thing were certain wounds which created, uh, you know, bad aftershocks. But coming to your question, yes, the economic uh, dimension has been extremely important. Uh, Greece uh, has been receiving at least 3% uh, of her GDP in uh, assistance, so infrastructure was helped, natural resources have been exploited, and human resources as well. And there is no exaggeration to say that within these 30 years, uh, a lot of development occurred. Coming to the Olympic Games, I have to say that uh, uh, a policy of overlanding and overspending uh, was exposed afterwards mm. when Lehman Brothers collapsed. and. Uh, this uh, 
uh, weakness was brought to, to the surface. But I have to confess that uh, uh, the European Union regulations and particularly the stability and growth criteria which had to be fulfilled, unfortunately, were not uh, honored, not only by us, by other uh, partners as well. So to a certain degree, this derailed the process. And uh, I have to admit that without the European solidarity at this moment, we would not be able to face with uh, uh, resilience and uh, in a forward-looking manner the future. It is extremely important that the European architecture not only remain solid, uh, but also proved efficient, adapted to circumstances, and uh, brought stability and will bring growth. And uh, we're very happy that uh, we're partners not only by name. We have been assisted, no matter with the street conditionality and no matter with high rates. Well, David uh, Daly, Ambassador for the European Union, if I could come to you on a, on a picking up on that, the economic theme, the OECD overnight downgraded its uh, world growth forecast and uh, in its commentary pointed to um, problems still uh, in Europe, particularly now as an Australian point of view, uh, a lot of our commentary tends to keep pointing the finger uh, at Europe. Um, give us a European perspective on, 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 on the global outlook and, and, uh, and, and Europe coming to terms with the post-GFC situation. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I'm very happy to do that. But first, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, express my appreciation directly to the Chancellor of the University, uh, Dr. Professor Gareth uh, Evans, for the fact that we are here in the European Union Centre in ANU, such a centre which is uh, funded by, by the EU. It could not exist without the help and support and the excellence of the ANU as an institution. So I want to take the opportunity, having the Chancellor sitting right next, uh, right next to me, to, to, to express that. Particularly since I bear no personal responsibility for this whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm very touched on the part of the institution. Thank you. I, w I was too disciplined to mention that. <laughs> but he's hoping you'll ensure that the centre will survive. Absolutely. <laughs> S sustainability is an important criteria. I think I did have a bit of responsibility for this when I saw it. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think the Australian government was very supportive of the centre being yeah, established. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. we're only in a cottage still. It uh, <laughs> doesn't but quite befit the status. Or, but, well, maybe it does, but you're going to tell us otherwise. No, no, no. no, no. It, 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 it does befit the status in terms of it being a heritage building full of history yeah. and full of meaning uh, for uh, the city of Canberra and for the university. Um, yeah, the, uh, the economic uh, situation is one which, um, th there are concerns in different parts of the world. I mean, you can look at Europe, you can look at uh, America and, and the situation there, and you can look at uh, questions in, in different parts of the world. In relation to Europe, I think the most important thing to understand is that the European Union is much more resilient than people think. And um, the Union has very clearly set out a range of measures which are addressed firstly at stemming the crisis right now and secondly at putting in place the building blocks so that we emerge with a stronger European economy and a stronger common currency, the Euro, uh, from this crisis. And I mean stronger uh, not only in terms of the, the currency going up or going down, but I mean stronger also in the sense of the system of having a common currency in Europe. The crisis has demonstrated a number of uh, weaknesses in the architecture of what we call the Economic and Monetary Union. Um, we've had the, the, the monetary union part of it with the common currency and the common interest rate and so on. but there have been some weaknesses exposed by the crisis. And um, these weaknesses are being very seriously addressed. For example, uh, the European Union is not what they call, what economists call a transfer union, um, where in, in the context, let's say, of Australia, whether Tasmania is running a, a deficit or not, 
uh, nobody knows because it is, it's automatically filled by the, the role of the Commonwealth as a transfer union. We don't have that in Europe. Now, two years ago, we didn't have anything like that in the context of the euro itself. We had redistributive policies for regional development and social cohesion, and, and, and they're also very important. But within a matter of weeks, uh, in the light of the crisis in Greece, European leaders saw the need to find a fund of money and put on the table a pot of money to help Greece, the act of solidarity that uh, Harris has mentioned. Um, three weeks later, uh, leaders agreed, we need this not only for Greece, we need a mechanism for other member states in this crisis, should they need it. Um, that was first set up as a temporary thing. Um, later, uh, this temporary mechanism, it was seen by leaders again, we should make this a, a permanent feature of the architecture of our common currency. And from that we have what we now call the European Stability Mechanism. All of these pots of money now mean that we have a, a hugely serious firewall set of funds, um, over 500 billion uh, euro, and with other contributions from the IMF and so on, uh, it's, it's uh, way above that. But this is just one example of how an important weakness of the common currency where we didn't have anything at all, now we have something very serious in place as a mechanism to ensure that we go uh, from this point on in a much stronger direction. There are other examples as well that I could give you. Um, a, when you have a, a, a currency, you have a unified economic policy. Uh, do we have that in Europe? Uh, no, not in the same way. But do we have an ever uh, increasingly coherent and coordinated and converging econ set of economic policies of member states? The answer is yes. We have agreed last year um, a program whereby uh, all of the member states come to Brussels and put on the, the table their uh, economic policy ideas, including their fiscal and budgetary policy ideas, um, which then get reviewed by the European institutions and by each other. There's a, a very strong peer review mechanism that has come in, mm -hmm. at the end of which there are recommendations agreed by all of the member states together that you, know, you should pay attention to this issue in that country and so on. These recommendations are extremely uh, serious and extremely far-reaching. And in the past, um, and here's again some of the weaknesses in Harris uh, mentioned the Stability and Growth Pact. In the past, when the European Commission would come uh, to the member states in the council uh, and say, look, we think actually this country, member state X or Y, is not really addressing itself to the recommendations. Um, when the commission would propose a sort of a sanction against the member state for that, um, it needed to get a majority of the votes in the council in favor of that sanction. Now, last year, member states agreed into law a reversal of that mechanism. So now when the Commission comes in front of the Council and says, look, Member State X or Y really is, is not following up on this recommendation and it's, it's, it's very serious um, and, and it proposes measures, uh, then those measures go through, those sanctions can go through unless there's a majority against it. Okay. So that shows you that there's a huge sea change in Europe in terms of uh, the approach of member states to the common currency. Well, Gareth, I was, I was wondering, uh, in, in view of that exposition, does that address a sort of economic euro scepticism that some, uh, some, some of our politicians and commentators in Australia seem to have? It? And put it in the context of the fact that we see the, we, we're embarking on the Asian century. You know, we have the, uh, we've just had the Asian uh, white paper, which tends to suggest that we're looking more to our region than back to our roots. Well, there is a, obviously still a degree of scepticism about the vulnerability and fragility of the European economic system. But I think basically, as David has just explained, uh, the institutions have been playing catch-up just fast enough 
to maintain a sufficient level of confidence that you can somehow stumble and stagger through. The whole history of the evolution of Europe has been making these brave leaps forward and then hoping to God that the institutions would catch up as problems revealed themselves and to leap into a monetary union without having anything remotely resembling common fiscal policy or a capacity to oppose common fiscal policy was a huge leap into the dark, only made possible because of everyone's sublime confidence that the stability would continue indefinitely. But having now run into this crisis, you know, the, the game is being played with fast and furiously, catch-up is taking place, and I think there's a pretty reasonable measure of confidence that, uh, that Europe will, will come through without you know, serious de further debilitation. Of course, uh, the focus very much in Australia, as emphasised by the White Paper, is on the, the future economic relationships in Asia. But don't let's forget for a second just how important the European relationship is to Australia. It's still uh, the biggest source of investment in. It's still, I think, the second biggest target after the US of investment out. So a huge relationship at that uh, level in terms of trade. I think you are our second biggest um, uh, export market and our biggest source of import still and overall our uh, you know, number two uh, trade partner, the Europe you know, collectivity. So this is huge uh, of continuing importance for Australia and the notion that any of this is just going to be sort of sidelined and in the rush to embrace uh, you know, the Asian century with all the opportunities it affords. Um, is nonsense. I think there's a you know, tremendous continuing uh, set of relationships here that are tremendously important. But at the same time, I mean, Australian policymakers and certainly those making economic decisions in Australia are going to continue to cast a beady eye over the current environment and not just at the European collectivity as a whole but the behaviour of individual players of real muscle like Germany. Is that is Germany really going to be committed to the collective or is it going to pursue its own you know, national anxieties about inflation, so at the expense of uh, effective common policy. Well, we've staggered through a few of those uh, potential roadblocks in the last year and no doubt will continue to, but people are watching that. And certainly in the case of countries like Greece that, I mean, as, as Harris has frankly acknowledged, I mean, there were real vulnerabilities in the system which were sort of papered over for years in terms of tax collections and indebtedness and so on. And uh, you, you've been forced to confront that. Some of the other Mediterranean countries have been forced to confront it in a really major way. And there is going to be intense continuing interest uh, from Australia economic decision makers as to how these problems are confronted. Not just because of the implications for the individual countries and how they manage to yeah. survive, but because of the systemic implications of, um, of things really going bad in, so, a, in, a, in a main player. So but overall, I think there's a degree of optimism. So Helmut, uh, from, from Austria's point of view, they're nestled away in the mountains in, in, in Europe. How, how, does, uh, how does Austria look out to, to uh, Asia and then, the, then Australia, you know, in, in, the, in the context that clearly we see the, the region as the emerging superpower uh, of the century? Well, let me put it this way. It's easier to look out to China because we're not taking for China and Australia and Austria. It's different, uh, mm. as people tend to mix us up all the time. Well, they do, yeah. Uh, Although I did notice that Austria's uh, economic performance is pretty good. And, uh, in fact, there, there is growth there, although you did fall into recession and we didn't, so we got that over. <laughs> uh, you, you're absolutely right, and we won't even you know, start to compare figures. I mean, our unemployment rate is actually a bit lower than Australia's, but pretty good in the European yeah, context. Absolutely, the, yeah. the growth rate is around 2.7%. Uh, and the thing we are still lacking is actually to beat this, the German soccer team, but no, no country is, is perfect in that regard. But when it comes, when it comes to Asia and Australia in particular, listen, uh, as you know, Gary Levin has pointed out, uh, when it comes to the EU's importance, when it comes to trade flows, etc., we are up there. Uh, and I don't think that will disappear. Uh, and Austria is basically part of that. When it comes to bilateral trade, Austria is very much exporting. Dependent. Uh, I mean, we have a fair amount, you know, of our economic growth, so to speak, is depending on on the export machine, so to speak, of Austrian firms, entrepreneurs, etc. Um, and even that, uh, the global financial crisis has brought forward, you know, on the one hand, clear lacunas, so to speak, when it comes to the structure and when it comes to the ways and mechanisms how to deal with the crisis. And the other hand, every crisis, you know, brings in an enormous chance. Uh, and the feeling we have in Austria is chances are and are being taken by European institutions, by national governments, etc. 
If I look just at bilateral trade, for example, with Australia, after the GFC, it went down a little bit. It actually reached the level of 2010 last year, and now it's actually looking up about 20%. Mm -hmm. Just a small part, you know, frankly speaking, you know, the, the overall trade with Austria at the end of the year with Australia might go to about the 1 billion euro. It's not a lot, but then, you know, we're about 8.4 million people. Um, so it's not, it's not a bad figure from that perspective. At the same time, and you mentioned the, the white paper. Frankly, when I looked at the white paper, uh, I thought, you know, it behooves every country, every foreign ministry well to look at the vision ahead to see you know, how you position yourself in the respective region you're in with the respective trading partners you have in this region, notwithstanding the fact that we from the European society, we will continue to be an important partner for Australia and vice versa. Uh, looking at the paper, uh, you know, there are a couple of things that come to mind. I'm interested to see how, for example, language instruction is seen in Australia and to what degree new languages would be more a focus. Frankly, if I had the chance between Austrian and uh, Chinese, with all due respect to the Chinese language, I would stick with Austrian. Uh, it's much easier mm -hmm. uh, to learn to, if, to start. If you're an Austrian, start, yeah. If you're an Austrian <laughs> or an Australian, <laughs> to start then. But those things obviously are quite understandable with regard to, you know, how does a country view its vision with regard to the education system, with regard to the trading system, etc. So we should come to Harris. Now, there are tremendous links between uh, Greece uh, and, and Australia due to migration. But uh, there also seems to be uh, a pessimism in Australia just based on commentary that maybe Greeks won't pull through despite uh, the, uh, what the help that's on offer from the EU. The austerity is too austere. The Greek people aren't happy with it. They may reject it. Can you give us a perspective on that? It is uh, extremely difficult as an exercise during this transition period for fiscal consolidation. It has started three years ago. Uh, so it has uh, a social cost. Mm. Since you cannot devaluate, you don't have a national currency, you have uh, to try to take all the necessary measures, not only to become competitive, and at this moment the measures have brought up almost 50% of the lost competitiveness, but secondly, you must uh, try to restructure, uh, fiscal regime, uh, trying to give the opportunity to the state not only to meet uh, the demands of repaying the debt plus interest, but also to keep uh, the society uh, on track, even a minimum level. So it is extremely difficult, and I have to confess that uh, what we face today in Greece is, first of all, a committed government, which for the first time is supported by three parties. This is very unusual for Greek politics, which were following a bipartisan attitude with a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, strong sense of opposing one the other. Uh, the second fact is that uh, last June, uh, the Greek uh, electorate responded favorably for the European option. Because in reality, there were two options, in or out within or out. Uh, this shows uh, a sense of maturity at a cost, but as I explained before, this uh, readjustment would not be possible if we did not have the support of the partners, because otherwise, very uh, frankly, we would not be in a position to continue borrowing at exorbitant prices in the free market. Speculation was attacking a very sensitive link, and this link out of the chain was Greece. Now, you ask me how people respond. I would say with the resilience and a lot of maturity, the situation may be difficult, that means one out of four out of business, one out of two young people out of business as well, but uh, the fundamentals of the society, in my humble opinion, are uh, strong. That means there is uh, let's say, a specialized workforce, which is extremely interesting. There is the entrepreneurial spirit, which is uh, keeping the flame alive. And uh, uh, the readjustments brought by this uh, uh, necessity um, will have, in the long run, a positive effect, because, just to give you an example, 
the recent tranche we received, and it was two days ago, if I'm not mistaken, David, uh, for the first time, half of this amount, I think it is 32 billion, uh, no, one third, I'm sorry, of this amount, will be for the first time devoted not to payment of interest and the capital which we borrowed, but for uh, rejuvenating the economy. So what happens today is extreme austerity. You know that even for a person who does not have an economic background, it is mathematically known to every uh, person that uh, extreme austerity is going to have as a consequence the uh, minimization of uh, the GDP buy. So you are going to have less income, less taxes, and so on. Uh, we are trying to face it with uh, the support of uh, the institutional partners. Uh, and uh, for the first time, not only there is a firewall, we are going to help with the capitalization of banks, and also there is a provision, there is the growth compact, as it is called, which is extremely important. It will focus on the unemployment issue, and uh, uh, social cohesion is going to be protected. So once again, United Europe comes again and helps. I think that our work was, uh, for the, for, uh, as a priority, first of all, to acknowledge what has been the weakness and problem and take immediate action. We understand very much that without the institutional support from our partners, it would not be possible, and uh, we're committed to do it. Uh, the collateral damage, the social, let's say, uh, pain and effort, these are things which, in my opinion, are going to be remedied also with the, sense, the strong sense of solidarity, yeah. and we're determined to do it. Good. And just one small thing, because it is important. We want to be successful, not only because we believe in Europe, we want also to avoid extremism coming out of such a, a fa an eventual failure of the experiment. And also, we would never like issues of social cohesion, problems of social cohesion, to spill over to other countries. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to come in with a couple of points of linkages between what Harris has said and, and, and Gareth before. Uh, firstly, to, to reiterate that the, the solidarity that's shown by member states of the European Union to other member states, to Greece, to Ireland, to Portugal, to whomsoever, this solidarity is one side of the coin, and the other side of the coin is responsibility for better economic uh, governance and, and so on. Now, earlier this week, we had a very positive meeting of the finance ministers of the Eurogroup that decided and that saw clearly that Greece has met the conditions for the next tranche, and this is a, a major uh, step forward. And there are all sorts of ideas as to how things can be facilitated and, and the burden can be uh, less than it is, while at the same time having the economic rigor that is needed to bring back competitiveness and growth in Greece as well as in the other countries. This is one thing. The second thing is, Gareth asked a very important question in relation to this. You know, um, those member states who are uh, participating on the solidarity side of the equation, um, to what degree will they do that uh, within the EU system. And the next topic we discussed was Asia. And I think this is a very interesting thing to look at these two issues together because um, they are connected. Uh, the reason why uh, member states of the European Union show the great degree of solidarity to others, such as Greece and the others, uh, the reason why is because we're all in this together. We're all in the European internal market together a market of 500 million people, where goods, people, capital, services flow freely. Uh, we are all in the weight of the European market on the world stage as the largest trader, exporter, importer, and so on. And when you put the economic dynamism, which is clearly shifting to Asia, and you put that into the picture, and then you ask yourself the question, well, how, how do you see European countries reacting to that Asian dynamism, do you think European countries view that they should react in terms of 
some sort of weakening of Europe or implosion of Europe or not rallying well, it's in, together. In fact, it's in China's interest that, uh, that, uh, yeah. that uh, Europe be strong economically because it buys all of China's course. Of course, but it's also in our interest because mm. yeah. uh, across Europe, we see ourselves facing the Asian century, mm. not only as strong Irishmen or Brits or Germans or Estonians or Portuguese, yeah. but as strong Irish, Brits, Estonians, Portuguese, yeah as part of a strong Europe. Mm. And it is the European reaction that will matter uh, most for us. So there is, a, there is an important uh, linkage of these two points, which sometimes uh, gets Now today, uh, today um, when you got out of bed and read the newspapers or turned on the TV, listened to the radio, you heard that the uh, Prime Minister of Australia had a, uh, a close run thing yesterday over how Australia would vote in the United Nations on whether um, Palestine should be uh, given observer status. Now, Gareth, has the Australian government made the right decision, and how how will this be viewed in your in, in Europe and elsewhere? In your opinion? Well, we've avoided a catastrophically wrong decision, in which we would have been uh, very much on the, as I've constantly said, the wrong side of history and certainly alienated ourselves from the neighbours and alienated ourselves from a huge amount of global opinion as well, including overwhelmingly in Europe. So when you say neighbours, you mean uh, Islamic neighbours like, uh, for example... Uh, well, Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia, certainly, yeah. very yeah. obviously, yeah. where passions are pretty high on this issue, but also the developing world generally was totally of one mind on this particular issue. They want to see the self-determination statehood issue resolved. They want to see movement towards genuine negotiations. Mm. They saw the necessity for some kind of additional leverage momentum to be given to those who are willing to engage in those negotiations. Um, Mohammed Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. Um, there's a bit of residual sentiment for more tough line positions, of course, of the kind that we associate with the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, in the region. But I think overwhelmingly people just saw this, as Bob Carr described it, as really a referendum on the statehood issue, even though it's only about this limited observer state status and nothing very substantive is going to be achieved by this. Certainly nothing so substantive as to alarm Israel and a lot of the stuff we're reading about how this is going to put Israel at risk in all sorts of ways or inhibit uh, movement towards you know, negotiation of the issues in which Israel remains intensely and properly interested, like national security and borders and so on. I think everyone really saw this as just an, an entirely legitimate, given the overall circumstances that are running at the moment, a legitimate way of pressing the Palestinian cause, putting some wind in the sails of the more moderate uh, Palestinian entities at a time when that was obviously becoming rather crucial, and an environment in which I think basically Israel just misread the situation in resuming to normal obduracy mode and saying there's only one way to do this as a bilateral track. I think they misread it in all sorts of ways and it, it, for us to have gone along with that misreading would have not only not helped in any way the situation in the Middle East but would have profoundly hindered our own credibility, not least uh, facing the next two years on the Security Council. So it was absolutely the right way to go. I would have preferred a yes vote, but I was perfectly happy with an abstention. Well, well Helmut, um, Europe uh, in the past has tended to be uh, more sympathetic to, um, to the Palestinian cause, if I can put it that way, without wanting to overstate it too much. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask the, the three EU uh, representatives here in one way or another. Um, will Europe act as a bloc or will each country um, have a look at this vote uh, separately when it comes up tomorrow? Well, frankly, when it comes to the UN system per se, uh, and you look at the voting pattern within the United Nations, you realize that, and that normally takes a fair amount of coordination yeah. and discussion among European Union member states, in over about 98% of the votes coming to the United Nations General Assembly, for example, the European Union, European Union member states vote the same way. Yeah. So there's always an effort, obviously, and it goes with our sort of cohesive approach to its foreign policy, obviously, to sort of find, to find common ground. Uh, and frankly, in almost all the cases, we find that. Sometimes it doesn't work out. The Middle East and Middle East resolutions in the past have been one of the few cases where there are not only long discussions, but also sometimes the voting pattern sort of varies among the European Union member states. But overall, this, the, the, the attempt is always there to find a common position. 
Now, when it comes to the UN, and I have a bit of experience within that particular uh, organization, uh, the, the issues uh, and how countries vote, uh, I would normally not discuss uh, for certainty 24 hours before a vote comes up or might come up to start with because those things change. Yes. Those things change because obviously, you know, contacts between foreign ministries, whether at the European level or others, are there. Other member states undertake the marshes uh, in foreign ministries, bring forward their point of view, and those things develop. Um, I joked with the Chancellor before that I'm sure during his, his time at foreign ministry, Canberra always sent it out instructions far ahead, uh, or thereabouts. Uh, in, in case of Vienna, that's not always the case. Let's mm -hmm. put it this way. There's a process. Um, and so from any vote which might take to, uh, place tomorrow, and that's the foreseen one, uh, I would assume that every attempt is undertaken within European Union member states to find common grounds. What about the, how does Greece read this situation? Or is it too, too early to say because it's only 12 hours? Well, uh, it is a process uh, which has not been finalized. So. I cannot predict it, but uh, I agree with what uh, Helmut said. We're working in the direction of having a coordinated position. And you know, especially for us, we're so close to the, to the neighborhood. So we have a sensitivity, a particular sensitivity to the issue. Uh, we engage with both parties. And I believe that uh, it is a long uh, traditional position of the part of the European Union to be very focused on the Middle East. Uh, this applies not only to the public opinion, but also to all echelons of the societies. Uh, it is an opportunity, but at the same time, we have to respect uh, diverging you know, nuances. But the effort is to find a common denominator. As I read the situation in Europe at the moment, the divisions are not really very serious. There's only one or two countries at most that are contemplating a no vote. Um, overwhelmingly, the rest are going for either a yes or an abstention, and in this current context, it doesn't matter awfully mm. much which you opt for. There's not a huge amount hanging on it. There will be 130 plus yes votes. There will be certainly less than 10, I think, no votes, uh, particularly now with Australia taking this position, and the rest will wobble about in the middle zone, plus or minus 50 abstentions. But uh, either way, I think the message that will come out of Europe will be a pretty clear one, even if it's not a unanimous exactly. one. But I mean, I, can I just say generally about uh, Middle East policy for Europe, it has been an area, frankly, of disappointment for most of the rest of the world for a long time now, that this is one of the classic areas in which uh, Europe, I think, has been seen as punching below its possible weight, not least because of the enormous financial resources you've had available to exercise leverage with in terms of aid development policy. But none of that has really translated into very visible political influence. Um, the quartet in which Europe is uh, one of the four participants uh, was once famously called by Amra Musa the Quartet Sontoire, the Quartet Minus Three, with um, the other three bowing regularly and rather unhappily on many occasions to the United States' uh, influence. I myself have been rude enough on a couple of occasions to refer publicly to Tony Blair's role as envoy as having proved about as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike. Um, and that's probably a little harsh in all the circumstances, but maybe not too harsh. And I'd like to ask my European colleagues to, to respond to this, because frankly, I mean, we all know the degree of difficulty in getting a coordinated position on anything. But in, and you know, and then Israel has obviously got some real historical resonance, which is for a couple of countries in Europe, which has made uh, it difficult to get some really tough positions agreed when arguably they've been necessary on occasion. But do you feel, David, do you feel, Harris, do you feel, Helmut, a sense of disappointment that Israel could have been a bigger player in pushing towards that comprehensive settlement that we all know is the only way to resolve this issue? Because I have a sense of disappointment. I was, I was sitting there in Brussels for 10 years running the International Crisis Group and working with all you guys um, on this stuff. And I, I was left with a sense of, come on, this is, this is something you can do better on. Yeah. I think that um, there, there are a number of things there. The first is that um, I would, in looking at the transcript of what you've said, Garrett, I would put in the word yet into some of your sentences um, because <laughs> it is far too soon, far too early to be overly pessimistic on, on Europe's uh, role on this question. And I would point to the, the period when you were in Brussels was also a very exciting period for us as the European Union 
because it was exactly the period when we were ser beginning very seriously to get our act together in the foreign policy area. And you, you have seen, and, and we've discussed before, uh, the, 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 the work of, of people like Chris Patton on one side and Javier Solana, Dr. Solana on the other side, uh, of how uh, working with the foreign ministers of, of member states, uh, we have navigated through some extremely difficult, complex foreign policy issues, firstly in our own backyard in the Western Balkans. And that was a very exciting period. Now, the excitement, you'll be very happy to know, there's no diminishing of the excitement. It's still a very exciting period in terms of European foreign I policy. Excitement. I want Why? quality performance. No. <laughs> Why? But that's what I'm getting to. No, but what, Why? Surely because because what's, needed is, no, no, no. what's no. needed is leadership. No, no, no. We'll, let me finish. We'll because that, that is the point. Because now we do have a uh, much more visible and a much uh, stronger institutional setup for that uh, foreign policy scenario. I mean, the, the famous question from, from Kissinger, if I want to ring Europe, who do I call? Well, now he does have. I mean, Kathy, Ash uh, Kathy Ashton's phone number is the phone number for Hillary Clinton to call today. Mm -hmm. So and this do you really is think that helps? this <laughs> definitely this definitely helps. You, you, there's there's no doubt about it that we are much more a player today than we were in the past. Now, talking of the Middle East, the European uh, position on the on the Middle East is is is, is well known. Uh, we're a very strong supporter of Israel. Uh, we're a very strong supporter of negotiations to having a, a two-state uh, solution. Uh, and so on. Now, we're very strongly supporting, as, as you mentioned, with technical assistance and finance and so on, uh, the Palestinians. Now, is the European role felt enough on this question? There you can have different views, and, and, and you expressed a disappointing view that we're performing below uh, our weight. But I would give another example. Who's negotiating? Who's leading the negotiations with Iran on the question of the nuclear issue, it is Europe. It is Cathy Ashton. But you still haven't put enough on the table there to make any difference. I, I, I would disagree. I think that the oil sanctions that, that we uh, put out have clearly okay, uh, brought I'd, I'd Iran like to, back uh, to the I'd negotiations. Like to, I'd, like so the are, I'd like to throw the discussion over but to it the is floor. By these, it is by these yeah. things, which may seem small, but it is by these things that over time you see, oh my God, actually, Europe is much more of a player today than it ever was in the past. So do, do either of you uh, have something, just a, a, a quick comment to finish on that, or we, we'll go to the whole discussion? It's just a small yeah. uh, dimension. It has been touched uh, by Dr. Evans. I think that um, it's extremely important for the Australian public opinion to know that uh, the relationship between Europe and the PRC, and in general, Asian region, is uh, so strong and so important for the future. The convalescence of Europe, which is going to be uh, imminent, uh, will have uh, a very positive uh, salutary effect in this dimension. And I think that it has to be understood uh, for in Australia that this also is extremely helpful for Australia herself. Mm -hmm. I'll gladly go to question if it comes up. I can say something about the Middle okay. East, too. All right. Well, thank you very much. So, a very stimulating conversation. Uh, Someone, let's over to you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like you are a, the chancellor. <laughs> list I sound like a totally carping misery bags here. Look, I mean, <laughs> I, I do think, actually, the European Union deserved the Nobel Prize, not for what it's actually doing now, which leaves a lot to be still desired, but for what it is. I mean, there's no question but that the EU is by far the most successful conflict prevention enterprise the world has seen in the last half century, just by its very existence. And we must never forget that. Thank you. I also, and I also think that Europe is trying, the EU is trying fantastically hard to get its institutional structures right, and there has been really significant evolution, the common foreign service, the focusing of foreign policy, spokesmanship in a single individual. I think there's been an unwillingness to match that with putting some real strength in terms of the individuals and so on called into those institutions, but this is all one step at a time. And there's a real difficulty when you've got 27 countries, some of them who still aspire to be major players on the global stage, like Germany and France and the UK, when you've got countries that 
aspire reasonably to be serious players on the regional stage, those here, Poland, and so on, and then many states, you know, the Cypresses and the Luxembourg. Mm. But how on the hell do you get with those completely different perspectives and how to approach these issues, common consensus around a table? It's very, very hard work. I know from long experience in dealing with people around a table in, in Brussels. Okay. But I, I do want to congratulate the Europe's, Europeans for what they've done so far, but the glass is, the glass is more half full than half empty, but there's still, still a bit of water to go into it. So Gareth, quarters followed, but Gareth forever. you are a diplomat after all. <laughs> <laughs> within limits, within carefully defined limits. So. Anyone with an observation, a question or a challenge? We can continue here for another five minutes or so. Well, I would like to... Um, oh, when they, sorry, yes, yes. yes. No, wait for the microphone because we want to record your uh, com Just comments a, for posterity. A, a bit of a comment and question. I thought the statement um, uh, from Greece um, that the fundamentals of Greece are good when one in two young people don't have a job. H how is that possible? If that was the case in this country, um, I can't imagine what we would be doing. I mean... I find it a bit extraordinary to say the fundamentals are good when one in four are out of business and one in two young people do not have work. The fundamentals in my assessment are good. Thanks for the question, first of all. The fundamentals, I think, that they are healthy because, first of all, uh, Greece uh, has the first in size, uh, globally, commercial fleet. So ship shipping industry is a very important uh, asset. Secondly, tourism is a major industry. Just take into consideration a country of 10 million receives 20 million every year. Thirdly, uh, the energy map in the Eastern Mediterranean is changing today. And for the years to come, now we're at uh, uh, this phase of uh, oil and gas prospection. So what has been discovered in Israel and it is already operational. What has been discovered and is already operational in Cyprus has a natural sequence in the region. And uh, it is expected, this is not my words, it is a last survey which projects for the 20 years ahead the possibility to earn double our debt. So these are the fundamentals. But I fully agree with what you're saying that the current situation is not bright at all. If you ask me what uh, led to this, I will be very frank, and I already mentioned it, uh, ineffective governance, which was overlending, secondly, overspending. So this is where we are. And the question is that uh, people show that they are resilient and moderate, because in any other society, things would have been difficult. To give you an example, my salary may have been decreased by 45% the last three years, but uh, we have to move forward and we must not lose the wood for some trees. So I fully understand what you say, and uh, what is the most important fact is that uh, the Greek public opinion understands that. And I have to add also an Australian component. The Australian Hellenic community is uh, feeling this sentiment as well. But uh, we have not only to redeem ourselves, we have to move forward. And if I'm not mistaken, the assistance uh, uh, in lending which we got uh, from uh, the rest of the partners is at the order of 32,000 euros per capita. Am I right, per person? Yes. So yes. you can imagine that it is uh, uh, in economic, let's say, annals, we are going to be mentioned as uh, a test case but we are committed to become a success uh, test case. Uh, the, we do not hide behind our finger and saying that everything is rosy. What we say is we are committed, and this architecture, which is in fact shared sovereignty, uh, even in, in this uh, difficult stage, showed resilience and response. And uh, I would not say, let's say, I would never like us uh, not to perform. On the contrary, we have to build up our country and uh, based on these healthy fundamentals, we can move forward. Okay. I'd just like to add two quick sure. points on that 
Firstly, the question of youth unemployment across Europe in many countries is very, very serious and uh, provoking uh, very serious responses. Um, it's not only in Greece. Um, one of those responses comes from the Compact for Growth and Jobs, which was agreed in June of this year, where 120 billion euro of investment will be made in, uh, in the creation of, of jobs. But that is being accompanied by uh, a, a, another element, which is the question of economic reform across many of the countries of Europe, in particular in relation to the labour market, to free up the labour market, to make it function more perfectly so that um, our, our qualified, well-educated youth are able to get jobs in that more flexible labour market. This is part of the whole range of structural economic reforms that are needed uh, in, in many countries um, in order to help regain competitiveness. Now, is this an impossible task? No, and Ireland shows that it is not. Ireland is going through a very tough period. Ireland has also been receiving uh, solidarity funds from other member states. But investment in Ireland is up. Ex Irish exports to the world are up. The Irish economy remains a, an economy where the fundamentals are absolutely sound. A strong business environment, flexible labour market, English-speaking, educated, skilled workforce in the European Union internal market of 500 million people. This gives an, un, an underlying <coughs> economic resilience. And we are seeing the signs of that right now through the progress of the Irish economy. In, unemployment in Ireland is still high, far too high. There's always a time lag between some of these indicators of growth, of exports, of investment, and jobs. There's always a time lag. But the Irish case is demonstrating to everybody that these difficult challenges can be faced up to. Okay, uh, we're just about um, out of time, but I do have um, a question for Helmut. I did notice as I was reading up on uh, Austria that uh, the Austrian government would like to have its budget back in balance by 2016, where we'd like to have a surplus by, by next year. So do you think <clears> that uh, maybe you're more realistic or, or is there much of a debate over well, that? Well, I, I try not to sort of, you know, compare in particular the host country with Austria when it comes to budget, uh, you know, <laughs> forecast in particular. I'm glad to see the budget coming up in the second quarter of next year. And I'll, I'll see what that contains. I'll, 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 read, that, I'll read that with interest. Uh, th there is a consolidation, uh, a consolidation process going on in Austria, obviously, too. Uh, our, uh, our debt ratio uh, is actually pretty good uh, comparative to other states. But there are issues in Austria, too, uh, which had to do partly also with our banks and our banks' involvement, in particular in Eastern European, Southeast European countries. Um, but let me, let me jump just to, to one thing because it came to mind in particular after David said about the experiences in Ireland. I guess all our governments are aware that youth unemployment is a big issue because it goes without saying that the earlier you can actually have young qualified people enter the job market uh, in particular, and I, I focus on qualified and good qualifications, the better it is. And it also goes without saying that when it comes to social cohesion and the social peace in a country, uh, that's an important element too, let alone from the fact that frankly all the young generation which enters in the Austrian job market right now will hopefully finance my retirement um, in, in the sense of a social compact and I'm sort of serious about that. Uh, but one thing one shouldn't forget when it comes to the European Union and I, I say that from a very personal perspective too, what it has changed for my generation or for the young generation is that those generation, this generation has gotten much more flexible and mobile when it comes to, for example, studying abroad, working abroad, etc. Erasmus and other problems that are available within the European Union opened up enormous door for the young generation to go to places they haven't gone before. Uh, also with regard to language capabilities, sort of, you know, getting better knowledge and understanding of other cultures, etc. And that obviously then translates into the job market. You know how it is. You study one or two countries in two, one or two years in a country, you like it, you feel there's a lot of affinity there, you might go and work there, which nowadays can be done easily within Europe. 
And it's one of the biggest chances, chances it basically opened up for the young generation. And finally, uh, and echoing what Chancellor Evans said, uh, with regard to the Peace Prize, the, the overriding theme I see in discussions I have in Austria with the younger generation, but also with generations about the European Union, is the understanding it is a unique peace project. This is understood not only partly because we have run, you know, or our generation, not our generation, but our, uh, our nations have run through two terrible world wars, but with the understanding that it was actually brought to us is a period of peace and quiet, notwithstanding, and we all regret that, that we did have a war on European soil in the Balkans in the 90s. And having said that, the way we in Austria, and I'm sure our European Union member states look at, at it, is the enlargement of Europe is not finished. This is an ongoing project. We are 27 now. We will be 28 with Croatia next year. And we in Austria, and that's where I sort of try to bring my heart of Austria, heart of Europe in again, are very much looking forward to other member states in Southeastern Europe, you know? And Turkey. No, no. Southeastern, Southeastern Europe. <laughs> <laughs> to come into the picture. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much to our panel for this uh, conversation. The second last for the year, uh, the last will be next Tuesday at lunchtime, and the stand it's the United Kingdom and Italy. And uh, who else? Oh, yes, of course. And the EU itself, <laughs> in the person of David Daly. And Australia, of course. And Australia, yes. Who's coming from Australia? Richard Miles. Oh, Richard Miles, Miles yes. Secretary. There we go. So uh, as a, um, thank you very much for your uh, contribution, and thanks for your participation. Good evening.